Hi, everyone. Welcome to another Cynthia Hollywood Ask a Hollywood Expert. Uh, my name is Kylie, and I'm a section manager for the Hollywood section. So if you're still in school, you just graduated, you're early in your career, or you're trying to figure out a change, there are a lot of jobs out there that you've probably never heard of. If you were in school, you probably heard about director, maybe editor, producer, but there is so much more to Hollywood than the people that get the Oscars. <laughs> so we're going to talk to somebody that came to LA from the Midwest and worked his way up and now works for uh, a manufacturer on the software side. So a little bit of housekeeping before we start. Everyone on this call is muted and you should stay muted. If you have a question for Matt, you can just click the speech bubble and type it into the chat box and make sure it says send to everyone so it doesn't get missed. And then I'm going to select as many questions as I can for our conversation from your feed. And also, if you change your view at the top to active cameras or who's talking, it should give you the best experience. So you don't have a bunch of empty boxes with different people's names in them. So let's get started with Matt. Uh, our guest is Matt Christensen. He's a software quality engineer for Premiere Pro at Adobe. He's going to tell us his story in getting started, and then we'll move on to the Q&A. So go for it, Matt. Thank you, Kylie. I'm going to start sharing my screen. Do you see that? Yep. Great. So thanks for having me uh, here to kind of talk and answer questions and, and show my story and getting started and getting to where I am. Uh, you know, it's always a little uh, nerve wracking to tell a bunch of strangers all about yourself for a few minutes, but I'm going to try and do that and keep it interesting and, and moving along. Uh, so let's see, I am from Omaha, Nebraska. Uh, it's the largest city in the state. It doesn't have many other large cities around it. So growing up, that's where I was from and I, and I was proud of it and I really liked uh, living there. But when it came time to start thinking about what I wanted to do for, for higher education, I was on the fence between going into computer science or filmmaking. Um, I had taken some classes kind of getting into the subject uh, in high school and I, I honestly could have gone either way. I flipped a coin and really decided to go with film school and um, got accepted into a school out in LA. So that was sort of my reason for, for going to LA. But as I was thinking about what I wanted to share here and going through some really old photographs, um, I figured I should share that even in the summer before going to school in LA, I remember I got a filmmaking for dummies book because I really wanted to just get into it. And at that time, uh, kind of to what Kylie mentioned, I pretty much thought that I wanted to be a director. Like most, I think everyone who starts at film school or has only seen the Oscars and, and seen some movies, you know, the director is kind of the main spotlight, the the author of, of, of all the films. And so that's where I wanted to start. And so here are some photos of me trying to be a director um, in the summer before I went to school. So I was I was shooting some different things. I was trying to make a little short film and I had no idea what I was doing. So it was great. I, you know, I had no, no training with it, but was trying to make it work. Um, and let's see. So then, like I said, I went to LA for film school and I had been to LA once before that summer to do like an orientation, but before leaving for school had never been to California at all. Um, and so it was a big move and, you know, my, my parents were able to come with me to orientation, but when it came time to actually come out to college, I came by myself. And so here are some pictures of me getting started at film school there. That top left one, you can see two suitcases and two bags, and that's just what I flew to LA with and got started. Um, and so uh, Loyola Marymount is a, is a film school over kind of by the airport in the marina in Los Angeles, and it's really great. I, I think it was a perfect choice for me, and what kind of drew me to it was it was a full-on film school. They had, you know, stages and all the equipment and like film classes and the degree in film production, but it they focus on keeping class sizes very small and, and a lot more accessible. And it, it kind of, I don't know if I could have told you this at the time, but looking back, I can definitely see, I was i was interested in not having the the like spotlight and pressure of something like USC or, or, or something like that. I, 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 I was concerned that that wasn't the right fit for me. And I think looking back, I, I was very lucky to have 
subconsciously realize that. Um, let's see. So yeah, at this point, I would have told you I wanted to be a director. As so I was beginning the studies and everything like that, I was trying to figure out how to write stories, how to tell stories and shoot them. And then uh, I was, again, I think very fortunate. There was a on-campus job fair about different, you know, work-study jobs you could do to while you were there and the film school had some openings in the office of post-production. And so I knew I liked computers, you know, I had already played with Final Cut, I think Express at the time. And I was like, yeah, okay, you know, this will be cool. And, and I was in that job all four years when I was at school. So I really kind of like fell in love with post-production uh, through doing that. And so even though my degree was in film production and there was no specific emphasis in editing or anything like that, I got to help students as they were finishing their thesis films editing, you know, troubleshooting, and just all the kind of fun that comes with that and, and those workflows. And so here are some pictures of the different edit bays we're using at the time. We've got some great retro shots of Apple Color, if you missed that. Um, and so the thing uh, that I wanted to point out is my perspective kind of shifted. there. And I was like, yeah, I, you know, I don't think I really want to do um, directing. Editing sounds great, right? Because editing is sort of the directing of post-production. It's, it's what gets all the attention. It's where all the glamour is. And so I really thought I wanted to edit. Um, and the, the interesting thing came about when it was time to do your senior thesis film. Uh, most every student is expected to sort of write, budget, finance, shoot, and like finish your film. And I just knew I really didn't want to do that. Like, it's like, I don't have a story I want to tell. I don't want to fake it and tell a, a crappy one and just kind of make a lame film. And so I worked with my professors and worked out, a, I think they called it a dedicated study as my thesis, where rather than doing the normal classes for that, I paired up with a mentor uh, who was actually my color teacher for this one class that they had on color. And, and my thesis was to take two other student films and do the entire post-production process on them. So I would be the editor, I would do color, visual effects, if there were any, and just sort of start to finish. So I had two friends willing to let me take that over for their student films. And you can see some of the, the pictures of that there, uh, including the top left one that was on set of one of the films uh, doing ingesting and that kind of stuff in, I think, Red Cine X, if I'm not mistaken. Um, I, I found this picture going through this, and I just love it because it was a picture I took of me, you know, in 2012, working out what an online, offline workflow might look like, uh, using a lot of the software for the first time. And I just thought it was pretty funny that over on the right there, if you can make that out, the end of my workflow was a dotted line to graduate. Like, <laughs> that's how I was looking at it uh, from that point. Um, and then uh, doing this process, again, sort of narrowed or, or I guess opened up my, my perspective even further as I realized maybe I didn't want to edit. And it sort of planted a seed that uh, my, my color teacher, who was sort of the mentor for this process, really got in my head, which is that you don't have to be an editor. And there is so much world, even just outside of editing, in post-production. And so if you like this stuff, you know, you don't necessarily have to feel like uh, you have to be an editor. And that if you don't want to be an editor, that you can't succeed in other roles. So after I graduated, uh, one of the first jobs I got a few months after school through a contact that I'm so grateful for was to start as an assistant editor. And I worked at a, a really small post house, you know, like eight or nine people. and it was mostly music videos and, and kind of short form commercial stuff. So I started as an assistant and I really value this time that I looked at because it forced me to support editors using all of the different software. Uh, it wasn't just a one, one software kind of place. So I you know, had to be familiar in them all, jump between one or the other, know the different keyboard shortcuts and just kind of jump around. Uh, and it was great, you know, it was, it was fun to work on that kind of stuff that was getting exposure. People would, these were AAA music videos people would actually talk about. Uh, and, and the thing that was really useful about this time is that there was a, a, the online editor who worked there at the time, I would, whenever I had a free minute, go and sit in his bay and just ask him what he's doing. Like, why are you doing this? What's the workflow for this? What, you know, and, and uh, he was happy to talk to me and kind of uh, keep me informed and, and educate me. And then um, the really crazy thing happened is that he just suddenly up and left one time. <laughs> And then the owner of the place was like, hey, Matt, you've been sitting with them a lot. I need an online editor. How would you like to do that? And that was a terrifying but amazing experience to sort of 
have that trust placed in me and then to sit down in front of a system and be like okay it is now responsible my responsibility to get this thing out the door and make sure that there's no mistakes um i think i want to say my first video that i was the online editor for was an avril Lavigne video so that was <laughs> still a, a crowning point of my career um but uh yeah th this was this was a turning point for me in my career because i was able to combine the very technical aspects of making sure everything is correct in online editing with uh you know the still the creative side of, of, of making sure the vision is being delivered and all that um, as I was going through these pictures, I found a couple really gnarly timelines that I had to conform, and so I just wanted to share them all with you to just commiserate in uh, what this time was like. These are three different music videos, uh, all from the same editor, and uh, this is the kind of stuff I had to conform, so it was very much a trial by fire um, to get this kind of stuff going. Uh, Around this time too, I want to make a quick side note. I did go in 2015 to this new thing at the time called Adobe Video World. And I had heard about it and it was getting started to using Premiere in, in our workflows because of Final Cut 7 uh, no longer being with us. And and I convinced my boss at the time to help with some of the costs. And I was like, you know, I think this, because uh, it's, it's training, there's sessions, you get to meet some Adobe people, I think it'd be really cool. And looking back, it's, it's amazing to me to now work for Adobe because I recall at the time, this was up in San Jose, when you go to visit them, you get to spend some time looking at their offices and hearing about their, what they do. And it's like, it's kind of a cool job. You know, you get to like make the software and, and there's all the, the decisions with it, but there's no way to move to San Jose. You know, like that, they don't want to move to San Jose and work in a cubicle and doing cool stuff here in LA and doing all that stuff. So it's just sort of like a little seed planted there. And uh, then I moved on to another job eventually. I started doing short form and EPK content for like Disney movies and things like that. And um, I got to be sort of the full-time on the net of color. So that was a great move because I was higher on in that role. So there, you know, there was no baggage of kind of at the other place, you know, we knew that you started as an assistant and kind of got moved up in a lucky way. Like this, I was doing color full time and, and loved it, to be honest. It, it was uh, really great, but uh, as as these things kind of start to happen, um, you know, things can start to go downhill, and, and this this company wasn't doing so hot. And I started to look around and and ask, okay, what is my next move going to be? Do I want to stay as a colorist? Is that what's making me the happiest? And I there was a little push and pull there and uncertainty, and um, uh, you know, I did some interviews at different colored places and, and was trying to keep my options open. And I was very grateful to have then heard that there was an opening at the Adobe. Um, and they were looking to start a small LA office. And so that sort of clicked all these pieces into place, tying in filmmaking, tying in computers, tying in uh, the seed that was planted uh, working at Adobe. And I, you know, I sort of had the thought in my mind, well, if I really hate it, if it doesn't work out for me, it's not going to be terrible in my resume if I have a year at Adobe working on the Premiere team, right? I could go back into post and it wouldn't be that that big of a deal. Uh, and also around this time, I started out with uh, helping the, the Blue Collar Post Collective launch their LA chapter. So there's a fun Kylie and me pick there that she did not know was coming today. Uh, and this is one of our first meetups. And so this was around that time. And it was also just great to have that group of people to help grow, but also to learn from and, and get support from. So I wanted to mention them as, as a big part of sort of my journey uh, in this way. And then last but not least, that gets me to where I'm at today at Adobe. So here's a bunch of fun pictures uh, making my job look really cool of all the different stuff I do. So there's me at NAB in the middle. I'm there at the Ace Eddies in the bottom right. A couple pictures with the team and various things. So um, that's where I'm at today. And then in this slide, I just kind of a little explainer of what I do in my current role as a software quality engineer. So I think it was a big you know, uh, I was able to bring value to Adobe coming from the post-production world. You know, most of the engineers and such have computer science degrees and maybe haven't done any editing. And a lot of the quality engineers like myself and my other coworkers come with some background outside of computer science and actually having worked in post-production. So we bring that that sort of user side to it. And so my day-to-day -day is, is working to develop, to develop new features on Premiere. Also, if we hear about bugs, trying to reproduce them and isolate them so the developers can work on them. 
And then specifically, my role in the LA office is to engage with the film and TV customers that are using Premiere here in LA, but also around the world, but on, on the sort of higher end, because that's where you know our team is basically tasked with making sure we're the best editor we can be for that high-end market, and then that those features trickle down and make Premiere the best editor uh, overall. So that's one of the things I value most about my job is it's not I don't have to be secretive. It's not a mystery about what I do. I'm out there on social media. I'm out there at events and can be very open and, and both explaining and learning from uh, customers. So that in a nutshell has basically been my whirlwind toward my career. So highly back to you. Yeah, that was great. Those pictures are adorable. Especially the ones where you really needed a haircut. <laughs> uh, can you stop, stop scare, scare? I haven't had enough coffee. Stop Would sharing. you like me to stop sharing my screen? Yes. <laughs> so to jump into it, the one thing that really struck me is, so you, did you graduate in 2012? Yes. I graduated in 2009, which is only a couple years earlier than you. And like uh, tape was still a thing for us. Web yeah. Cine X was released in 2009. So the industry changed so much in between when I entered it and when you entered it, even though we're very close in age. Was That's that right. still, was that, was that so very new, all that yeah. stuff? Or were, I, were, were you I had the very distinct, I had the very distinct recollection that I was glad that tape was on the way out, but I caught a little bit of it, like working in the office of post-production we had captured X and they passed into the different edit bays. So I was familiar with how to capture tape and, and play out to HD cam and all that kind of stuff. But then there was that big, I think it was a tsunami or a flood or something that took out all the, all the tape processing. And that happened while I was in school. And I remember hearing about that and I was like, okay, I'm not gonna be too mad if tape <laughs> kind of goes away. So yeah, um, definitely. Yeah, I've always been mad about that because I graduated basically in the last year when tape was really a thing and it made all my stuff look instantly dated. So that's one thing to be happy about. I don't think we're on the cusp of any really major format changes right at this moment. Not like that, although I could be wrong. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> how, how old do you think the industry has changed since you entered it, if at all? I think your point about you know, in 2009, Grand City X being brand new and all that is is a good point. I think there's just been like the utter democratization of video tools, uh, not just in pricing of software, but just the availability and the quality of it and, and everything like that. Like if you go back to that picture I shared of the workflow, you know, of figuring out how to get something I did, it was like cut and added Red City X for the dailies, get it into Apple Color, get it into Final Cut, that stuff, part of it was that I was new to it. You know, the people that were doing it full-time professionally then could do it in their sleep, but that is so much easier these days. And, and the, the tools and the kind of hardware that they'll run on and their overall stability and just, you know, all of that is there such that it's there for anyone to play with and the, the bar has just continued to be lowered. You know, I think that's, that's the biggest shift that I've seen. Absolutely. And a question from the chat back to uh, your story. When you were working on student films, you mentioned you did visual effects too. And this person was curious what exactly you did. I guess, what kind of visual effects happen in student films? They're visual effects that I'm glad are on tape and no one will ever see. Um, uh, yeah, no, it, it's, it's very light. It was, but again, that's I think a big difference from today is, is, is the tools are so much easier that it's easier to try things out. I can think of one that involved a dream sequence where a guy met a whale and so he was underwater. And they did actually shoot him through uh, like a fish tank so there was some water present on the on the footage. But you know, I was like adding some some water stuff and some various bubbles. So it was it was stuff like that that was like necessary to communicate the story. It was not the sort of finer stuff that I know how to do today and uh, you know, splits and all the kind of like fixing stuff. It, it was very basic. So I would be generous calling it VFX by today's standards. Mm -hmm. uh, but so, yeah. so it wasn't like online editing VFX. It wasn't like you were doing beauty work and student films. <laughs> no, it was more like there might be three shots in this film where we're going to do something to the footage us other than just color. We're going to 
So you mm -hmm. get what kinds of software were you using for that? Was it all like After Effects? That was, so I learned and was most proficient and happy in Final Cut 7, uh, you know, pour one out for that. But After Effects was installed on one of the machines and that's what I used for that. I, you know, I think there was one that involved a uh, plane crash and so it, there was a lot of camera shake being added and that kind of stuff. So it's very, very practical kind of by the book stuff. But yeah, mostly After Effects. And then the color, I'm pretty sure I all did in Apple Color at the time. Yeah, that's another interesting difference. Uh, we, we've been in the industry eight, 10 years, 11 years, and I got certified in Final Cut Pro 6 in Apple Color. And then those were basically done by the time you entered the industry, but you yeah. were still working in them. It shows how quickly tools can come and go. Um, what, what technologies do you think are driving the industry forward today? basically um, in a broad sense. What do you think people should be paying attention to? I, I kind of think mm, twofold. First of all, I, I wouldn't say that I'm, I feel like I'm particularly great at predicting future stuff. So, you know, I'm not gonna, and my, my answers might be kind of safe, but the, the two big things that I seem to keep hearing about more and more are, are HDR, obviously, which, which once that's there and accessible to everyone in hardware, I think will kind of become the standard in the way that HD has more or less replace SD fully. Uh, and then I think virtualization is is the hot button issue that won't quite go away. <laughs> so people are really interested in how can I virtualize my workstation so that I don't have to own and maintain a $20,000 machine, but it's there when I need it and can run my software and then can spin up and spin down. And so there's a lot of, a lot of that foundation is being laid now and, and with everything with the coronavirus shelter in place stuff, is the demand has just spiked like crazy. But mm -hmm. I, I would say one other thing about that, uh, that there, there's fundamentals of like tech literacy that also don't ever change and you need to kind of have. And so I think I would say in addition to learning those new things, make sure that you have those tech fundamentals down too, because it makes everything else easier. <laughs> in post. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that kind of goes into a question we got from the chat. It seems like your career plans kept evolving as you experienced new tools and new ways to get things done. So do you, how do you recommend learning all that and getting involved? Or do you get hands-on? Um, do you experiment? Are there resources that you go to? Yeah, the I mean, uh, this sounds a little tongue-in-cheek, but like Wikipedia is my favorite website. I <laughs> check it constantly for what's the spec for this? Or what does that actually mean again? Or how does this relate to that? And so yeah, I, mean, I make it a point every time that they put up one of those banners asking for a donation. So I'm like, heck yes, like this is you know, amazing that it's free. And so I try to keep that going. So use the internet and, and, and that gets your foundation there. But then I think when it comes to actually, you know, you can read every article out there about HDR, but you won't understand it until you try to do something yourself. So there's a, if you're a bootstrap kind of person, you know, download some sample camera footage that is HDR compatible, put it in a system that can grade HDR content and, and spit it out and like see what that looks like. But there's also, I think a lot of people who that's difficult to do and you never know if you're doing it right. And, and that's where communities like BCPC or other groups in your area or, you know, people you can, can reach out to can actually help you with or work on a project that's using that or something that get, to get tangible experience with it. Yes, uh, as you get deeper into the industry and there are fewer questions available at, online, it seems like having a good network and having a mentor is really important. How has mentorship uh, helped you or how have you been involved with mentoring people? The, uh, I, I have to give huge credit to the, the color teacher I mentioned before. Um, his name is Bobby Maribata, and at the time he worked for Codex, although I'm pretty sure he doesn't anymore. But uh, anyway, he he taught that color class at LMU and was willing to work with me for that dedicated study. And yeah, I mean, just having a person to bounce questions off of, you can't always Google how, why isn't this EDL from Abbott importing into color? And like all that. But when you get into too much of a nitty gritty, there's, there's no amount of, of Googling that can really help for that. And it's likely to actually be detrimental. Uh, so I was extremely fortunate and, and, and lucky. So I haven't ever yet done a one-on-one -on -one mentorship directly. Uh, I have worked with BCPC and as, as some of their efforts on that front, but that's something that I think as I'm sort of 
approaching the midpoint of a career, definitely want to look at and start to, to get back. So I think that's very important. I think it's important to point out that you are very online. You're on social media and you're yeah. helping people answer questions all the time. So anybody on here who's interested in getting help from me or any number of things should look you up on the Twitter, the twitter.com. <laughs> And it's interesting, um, something I had to sort of reconcile when I came to Hollywood and took a shift into a more workflow career is I got into movies because I liked the creative side and I felt like it would be sort of a failure if I was purely on the technical and just supporting stories. And it seems like you kind of came into it with the two-sided thing that I had where I was, I, I mean, I did a minor in computer science, you were considering computer science. So how do you balance creative and technical and how do you feel like you're really part of the filmmaking process? That was always the sort of the sweet spot of color grading for me was it's extremely technical. You can spend all day nerding out on it. But at the end of the day, when, when once the once the cameras are balanced, you are you are contributing to the storytelling and you are working you know, with the director or producer or both or the DP to make their vision real. And there's nothing more satisfying than, you know, toggling the A, B grade and showing them where we started and where we're at now and everyone's just loving it. So that has always, that's the, that's the little strand of, of keeping that creativity going that I like. And so I still, um, I still do freelance color on the side. I have my own kind of setup at home. And so that definitely has, has fed that itch. Think, or scratch that itch of keeping that going. Yeah, I think that's really important that you still stay connected to the user side, even though you're on the side where you're designing the user experience mm -hmm. or enhancing it. And so a question from the chat, moving to Adobe and getting a closer look at how the sausage gets made, what surprised you most about the software or the development process? Um, I think if if any if you've ever if you've never tried programming, try it. It's really crazy. Even if you don't like it, you'll have this sense of wow, it is amazing that anything ever works. And I had that sense already in post production, just knowing about how computers work. Like the fact that when I press this button, something lights up and I can work on it, and the video is playing, like it, it's a miracle on its own. But now getting to see the backside of it, you know, I don't want to give the wrong impression, but it is. It is incredible that any software ever launches ever. I think, you know, the millions of things that have to go right to even see a logo appear on screen is pretty crazy. And so that has been a real treat for me to, to be able to dive into that side of it. And and then uh, I, you know, I've also wanted to get into programming my own anyway. And so having these amazing engineers and developers just uh, a question away on Slack if I want to ask them how something works or how to build something in my own, it's like catnip to me. Sounds like a really incredible experience for a nerd like you. Yes. So another question from the chat. Which tools would you consider most important for an editor to learn, besides from Premiere, obviously? Um, they say they're proficient with Final Cut, learning Avid and Premiere, but would love to hear which ones are most often used from someone in the industry. I think the standard answer you'll get from people, and I, it sounds corny, but it's true, is you should know one piece of software well enough that you can edit fluently in it that you know you just know it and that's your preferred one and then you should be familiar enough with the others that it would take you at most a day or two to get comfortable and then if you got hired for them so i've you know it's different for different people because i've always loved if you know if a new editing software pop up tomorrow i would spend a day playing with it and, and dig into it if, if you don't care for software that much that's maybe not as exciting but uh there's no doubt. I, I know so many editors who were Premiere only, got hired on an Avid job, and they picked it up in a day or two, or they took a, a few courses online, and they're fine, and vice versa as well. People who only knew Avid and tried Premiere. I don't think you should get too hung up on which tools. If you already know those ones that you said, you're fine. So jumping off of that question to people who are in the industry but not looking to be editors or are editors, what do you think, what kind of skills do you think are broadly uh, applicable to people in the kinds of jobs that are with under, within Cindy's umbrella? 
what kinds of software or interpersonal skills just in general should they be building? It's funny, even before you said interpersonal skills, I was already just going to say in all caps communication skills. <laughs> uh, you know, if you take us out the technical part, the way that you see people fail or have trouble the most or cause more work for others is, is very basic failures to communicate either what they want to happen or what has happened. And so then assumptions get made and that can just derail the entire train of a workflow. So, you know, it's, it's amazing when you meet a post supervisor or a producer who can clearly and effectively communicate what, not just technically, but just, you know, you, you don't have to read between the lines to figure out what they want. And, and so that's, that's the best skill. And I'm, I think I'm good at it, but always trying to improve at it. So work on, before you hit send on an email, re reread it and make sure that it actually says what you want it to say and delete at least one or two of the sentences and then send it. You know what I mean? Like that's, those kind of skills are invaluable in, in this industry. Yeah. Bad communication can tank a show just like that. Because yeah. it spirals. It's a domino effect. Mm -hmm. Domino effect of misery. A more specific question from um, uh, someone in the chat. Uh, how would you recommend a recent graduate like myself get into the audio editing or sound design side of things? Um, they have a degree in digital audio production and they're in love with post-production. It's what they really want to do, but having a hard time getting employers to notice. So I guess even more broadly, how do you get from the point where you have the degree and you have the passion, but you get a paycheck for doing it? Uh, it's, it's one of those things that Unfortunately, I think it's hard to give specific advice for because everyone's story is different. In my case, I I almost included a picture of this, but I left it out. But I worked at the Apple Store as a Mac genius for uh, the last year in college, and then after I graduated, was doing that. And I had the option to go full time, and I specifically did it. It made paying rent very hard, and it made the you know bills very tight. But I was like, I. I want to keep doing freelance editing on the side at the time is what I was doing. And I want to keep it open enough that if I start to get regular work, it's easier to transition out of that job and not, and not be full-time nine to five of that job. And then, and then having some contacts through film school told me about that first open job. And that's what I went to from there. So I think it's, it's keeping yourself available for those opportunities, but also proactively seeking them out through things like, uh, user groups or BCPC or you, you have to be, it, it's kind of a chicken and egg thing, but you have to be doing some of the work to, to churn up those things. So find some way to keep growing your skills and getting that posted online or finding people who are looking for a mixer of sound designer and doing it for them. And, you know, and then you have to cross your fingers and <laughs> hope it works out to some degree. Another question from a viewer. What do you wish someone had told you or advised you as you face not only swapping paths in your career, but also moving locations? And how do you cope with all the changes and uh, find confidence in yourself to take the risk? Because one thing you said was, well, I'm going to try this. And if nothing else, I'll still have Adobe on my resume. And I feel like that's a really good point. Every decision you make adds to your story and it's a it's a conversation starter for the next thing yeah but it's still a risk and it's still scary i was even getting that on my uh, applying to that first job like oh you work at apple right and even just that i was like it's not what you think but sure i'll let you think that uh can you repeat that again real quick what's something you wish uh people had told you about making these decisions what, what's some advice you wish you had got as you face this path and this pivot uh, I think the advice that I would have given myself to sort of add to my confidence at that time is just that there's, there's more, there's so many more than one right way to get where you end up. And so you need to, you need to lose the fear that you're going to not be on the right path and just make sure you're on the right direction. Sounds really, really wise, I think, <laughs> but you know, it, that's, that's the thing is, is you can't know until you've done it. And so as long as you, you check in every six months or so and feel like you're moving in the right direction, uh, just keep moving in the right direction. 
and don't be too worried about getting the exact path or the exact job or the exact career path. That leads into another question from the chat that might not be something you can answer. Is there something that you're aspiring to or working toward right now, or are things kind of open-ended? Yeah, the next sort of big thing that I can see myself tackling is, is actually getting to the point where I could say I'm a programmer, where I could uh, you know sit down and intentionally write some software. I, I have some false starts and some you know, I've built a couple of tiny, tiny tools that I use every day at my job to make my job easier, but uh, that's still a long way from really understanding how writing software works. So I look at it almost as, like I said, back when I was in high school, I could have gone CS or I could have gone film. And I look, I look at it big picture almost like I really scratched the film itch. And now, because I'm at Adobe, I have both worlds open and I'm trying to fully scratch the, the programming software side itch as well. So, uh, absolutely. Um, oh yeah, can from the chat, can you give an example of a tool that you you program to make your your daily life easier? Do you mind if I share my screen? Sure. Uh, yes. This guy is a big part of what I do all the time in Adobe is installing all different versions of Premiere Pro. As you may not be surprised, these are all the different versions of Premiere that I have uh, installers for and different, what we call builds. Um, so each folder here will have an installer for Premiere. So all of the time, but only one can be installed at a time. So half of my time when I'm trying to test something is what version do I currently have installed right now? And you kind of have to launch the app, right, uh, to do it. Uh, you can launch the app and check about it. So I wrote this tool called Build Check, and it's running up here in the menu bar. And it just shows you for all of the, the four apps I mainly care about with Adobe, which version and which exact build of each are installed and the little trash button will kick you into the uninstaller. So really proud of this guy. <laughs> but but now, now when I need to test a certain bug, and it's like, okay, the bug only happens in this build. Instead of having to launch it and figure out what build I have, I just click on this and I say, this is what's currently installed. So that's my current, that's my current uh, proud little app there. That's that is awesome, actually. <laughs> it probably saves you so much time and heartache because you're like, what am I doing? Which belt am I in? It and does. I, I don't know. I don't know that. I, of... well, I was gonna say I don't know that I've made back the time saved yet because it took a lot of effort to learn how to make it. But I have shared it with other people on my team, and they use it. So I think as a net, we're <laughs> we're saving time. I think that's a good example of something you can do when you're coming up in your career to set yourself apart, to make yourself more efficient. Like nobody told you to do that. There wasn't mm -hmm. a sign to you, but you did it and then you're sharing it and being useful, um, which I think goes into another question. When people are entering their careers, basically entry level jobs, what can they do to showcase their skills uh, to, to the people they're around? I think the best way, uh, once you've got the job at least, is to spend the first month or two listening, right? Like, you don't want to, I think it's it's very easy uh, to come off as too eager when you first start something. And even if you are correct or do know something, you don't yet know in a new job the context of all that. So maybe you started a new thing and you're an assistant editor and you see someone doing a workflow and you're like, well, you know, I know on this forum, they said like, you shouldn't do that. But rather than telling them that first, you should maybe sit with that or ask questions and figure out there's probably a reason they do that, not just they're done and they haven't read that forum post they've read. But then once you've gotten through that phase, you can stand out and you can kind of uh, grow into that role by putting your hand up and, and, and proactively looking for things that need uh, fixing or improvement. So, you know, I could give a lot from Adobe, but even at like a post house or something like that, when you notice that a certain editor always has the same problem, you should volunteer to fix that. Say, I can, you know, we can retool how that works, or maybe I'll do this extra step and then you don't have to do that or things like that. And it doesn't, it doesn't mean you're going above and beyond your role. It just means you're not uh, you're not content to just sit in the boxes that you started. And by doing that, you'll start to learn 
other things, you know, other other ways to go about it. Absolutely. So going back to communication, uh, there was a, a question in the chat about working with directors in your role and in your previous roles. And I'm going to sort of change the question a bit to ask, how has it been working with somebody like a director when you're a colorist versus working in Adobe? And how did you learn how to, how did you adapt your communication style? Between the two, Travis? Between the two, when, yeah. when you're working as a colorist with a director, as long as things aren't like uh, over budget or super late, I usually find it's very, I, I'm personable enough that it comes pretty easily and, and, and as long as they're in a good mood, you know, it's, you're, you're, if it's going well, you're collaborating together. You don't want to have a director that's just telling you, press this button, do that now, right? Uh, and so I always, I always find it's best rather than, in, in those kind of situations, your communication is best off if you're asking questions about how to make it better, not saying, I want to do it this way. When it comes to what I do at Adobe and when we go and do visits to like the, the Fincher editorial team or like with the last Terminator movie, spent some time over with uh, Tim Miller's team and everything. That's different because I'm there as a rep of Adobe and I'm not there as a contributor to the film directly. So it's a lot more don't speak until you're spoken to, right? There are some cases where they'll ask you a question or expect your input, but it's 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 a lot more of, of listening and, you know, I would never tell them to do something differently <laughs> directly. <laughs> Whereas when I'm the colorist working with the director directly, I can propose, what if we took this scene this way or something like that. So it's it's knowing there's there's two things at play. There's like the the inherent power structure, which you should try to to stay within, but there's also knowing the like egos at play and how and how to how to guide them but not upset them. <laughs> so. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's something with going back to communication that I see younger professionals not quite get. Um, they come in the room, they think they're qualified, and then they start talking. And most of the time, the best thing you can do is not talk and listen, which you said. So what are some other big no-nos you see newer professionals doing? What are some mistakes that people in this can avoid? Yeah, I that brings back a horror story at one place I thought we, we had an intern and we, we would bring in an intern. And, and I loved it because if you're my intern, like we're going to have a day where I explain codex to you. Like we're going to just like, nerd out about long gap and stuff. But and he was good for that part, but then there was a time where a lot of our, one of our biggest clients was Disney and, and they came in and were reviewing a cut and he was in the room and he like put his opinion out there like without being asked, like in response to the one guy. And that was like a big no-no. And, you know, it, it thankfully everyone was chill enough there. It wasn't, it wasn't like a huge blow, but that was definitely a mark against that, you know, intern and we didn't forget that and it, it, it didn't go well or play well. So, that's that's the biggest thing I would say. Remember, it, it, like I said, if you're the new employer, if you're just getting started, you have to come from a place of of humility and saying, "Let me figure the place out. Let me learn where maybe my presuppositions aren't correct." And that just saves you from a whole category of errors or mistakes. Where even if you don't try to sound like you're the know-it-all, you kind of will come off that way. Um, that's that's honestly the biggest thing. And then also I would say in post-production, like if you can up your, especially for guys, if you can up your clothing choice, just like one notch, you don't have to dress up, but but how you are perceived and how you, you also hold yourself when you have a button-up shirt on and it's tucked in versus like a t-shirt and, and jeans, no one's gonna call you on it, but it's a difference between like proactively engaging with your job in a professional sense and just like, no one's gonna call me on it, right? <laughs> you know, and that, that makes a difference. Yes, thank you for saying that. Uh, that's just, I see so many young men um, going to interviews and graphic tees and ratty jeans. And they, I mean, they do tend to still get the job, but <laughs> That's a whole nother conversation to have. <laughs> yeah, there, there are, are that's that's the vibe of a lot of post houses, even high end ones, is they want it to feel casual. And so you also don't want to go in wearing a full suit, right? And, and feel very strange in that regard. But there just is a difference between clothes that aren't, you know, three years old and completely worn down and, and look like you didn't care versus I look like I chose what I wore. 
Yeah, exactly. So on the flip side, what is something that new professionals that are entering the industry at right now are actually surpassing experienced pros with, do you feel? I think it's a little stereotypical, but it's. I think I still see it and it's true that past a certain age of the experienced pros, there's still a lot more uh, pigeonholing, like I'm an avid editor or I am a this type of that. And and I, and I think that the newer people in the industry don't have that because of the just like utter democratization of the tools. So they aren't afraid to try the new thing or to learn the new way to do things. And that, that's a huge like, uh, you know, you don't have to dunk on the older I employees, but you can like low key just just run circles around them in some case. Uh, and then that's that's the superpower and that's that's the ability there. Mm -hmm. So when you're um, I guess you haven't necessarily been in a hiring position yet, but you are definitely in a recommending position or have been. So when you're recommending someone for an entry level role, what are you looking for in them? Um, I actually, I have done a little bit of, and I wasn't like the sole person in charge of hiring, but I have been in interviews where we're looking at if we're going to hire an editor or something like that. I think those two things that stick out to me personally and they're not necessarily going to land you the job, but they remove a lot of questions. And then if all the other pieces are right, you're good to go. And so one of those is that you have to seem eager to learn and, and, and like eager. I mean, even if you're kind of faking it, you have to, you have to seem eager, like you want to work there, right? Like that's, you're looking for someone who is both excited about the job tasks. Like I want to edit or I want to color or something, but also has done a little bit of research on the job they're applying for and why they actually want to join that and so even like i said even if you have to fake it and it's not your dream job it's not that hard to fake a little bit of here's why i'm excited to do this and then the other thing is attention to detail that can be hard to communicate in an interview but you can kind of get a sense of it from resume you can get a sense for it by being on time by promptly responding to emails all of those little things communicate a lot subconsciously did i have to follow up to call you to set this email or did you like follow up with me to confirm it? You know, th those kind of things go a long way. And, and like I said, if you do those two things or if you come off that way, then that puts you at least at the top of the pile. Yes, and a question from the chat. Um, does Adobe have an intern program? Do you know? They do, yeah. I think we just um, like, accepted or, or hired on those interviews um, as a company I, I want to say like thousands of interns come in that trickles down to you know a few in my organization and then a few for premiere but yeah um, one of the recent semi-recent like a year and a half ago that are features that I worked on was called freeform view and that was written almost 50 to 70 percent by a developer who had been an Adobe intern that had just gotten hired on and then worked on freeform so that's awesome that they had that big of an impact. And I think um, Adobe being a tech company primarily, um, they they would have paid internships and it's more of a yeah. traditional intern structure, yeah. unlike the entertainment industry where it's sort of like <laughs> free labor. Yeah, no, no, Again, Adobe, yeah, it's, it's all very formalized and, and you're hired on as an intern and everything. Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, so what do you think has been the most challenging part of your career so far? And how did you overcome it? Um, I can think of, I guess, two things. One, one was that first time where I sat in, in the chair as the online editor and it was my job to take that Avril Lavigne video to finishing and like check every frame and every edit point and, and the, the, the real con the, the, the way I overcame it was a little good old fashioned, like fake confidence, you know, at, you double check your work, you, you, you do what you can, but then at some point you just have to say, I might, it's either going to be correct or there's going to be a mistake and I'm going to learn from it and don't let that paralyze you. So that was the, the kind of trick of overcoming that. And also I have a mantra that no one dies in post-production. So, you know, I can have people angry at me at mistakes I've made or mistakes other people have made or things that have gone wrong. But like internally, I'm always saying to myself, no one dies in post-production. Like 
if I'm not building a bridge that's going to collapse and have tons of people die or anything like that. You know, it's it's all small potatoes when you can when you can zoom out like that. The other challenge in my career, I think, was starting at Adobe because that I didn't realize at the time quite how much of a shift it would be. It was really like a you know almost like leaving one industry and now I'm in the software development industry. Even though in my mind they're very related because of the closeness of the tools, but also because at the time the office in Los Angeles wasn't ready yet. So I switched from going to my work at a post house every single day for the last many, many years, you know, driving from Culver City to Hollywood. And then all of a sudden I was just at home and they sent me a laptop. You know, I think I went to San Jose for like one day of meeting my manager and stuff, but then it was just like, okay, now I work at Adobe. And it's like, what am I doing today? You know, what <laughs> this is a very, very abrupt thing and it Thankfully, I had some advice uh, from my wife at the time who was used to working by herself, but some, some habits to build and kind of work into it. And so that that was tough though to, to, to kind of, I was the online editor and colorist at the post office, so I was like at the center of all post things. You know, if I was sick for a day, that was a problem. And now all of a sudden I was a part of a very much larger machine that didn't yet need me in any way. You know, like I was just, I was brand new and tactile on the outside. And that was, that was a big change. So it sounds like uh, you got used to working remotely before all of this happened with the pandemic and work yes. from home became a huge thing. So it sounds like you were more uh, set up to really adapt to having to stay at home. But how has, uh, how has work in general changed in Hollywood and how has that impacted your work in the face of the pandemic? Yeah, so I think in Hollywood, it was very abrupt to suddenly you know, we have a lot of active email threads and sort of things with our customer engagements and people using Premiere. And that spiked incredibly, you know, in mid-March, early April, uh, as everyone was trying to figure out <laughs> what happens if I put my Premiere project here? Or what happens if I do, you know, all those questions. So it, it, gener it actually was a very big increase, I would say, in early April in our workload. There was a lot of like, you know, start at eight, end at eight, because you just, you're just constantly answering all that. So we were sort of at Adobe getting the the, the knock-on effects of everyone in Hollywood trying to figure out how to suddenly disperse, shut down, but keep keep posts that was already that didn't require more shooting, keep it going through the pipeline. Um, so that was that was the biggest change for us. And, and and then that in terms of my own personal work, you had to get even stricter than I had been at setting those kind of boundaries and saying, okay, it's 5:30 now. I'm not just walking away from the computer and leaving it up, but I'm gonna actually close my email, close my Slack, close Premiere, close. <laughs> I'm choosing to kind of end my day. I found that makes a big difference than just, I'm gonna go eat dinner now, because then if you glance at your screen, you still see it. <laughs> you still kind of wake up with it. Mm -hmm. um, from the chat, where do you, where do you look for inspiration, for creative inspiration? And where do you, how, where do you look to get refreshed as a professional and as a person? Hmm. Um, for creative stuff, honestly, I don't know if this just has to do with my roots in it, but I still love watching a good new music video. Uh, you know, they're sort of the like odd stepchild of, of the video kind of things you can work on because you can color outside the lines in those things, both on set and both in, in post with color, with visual effects, with playing with editing things is so much so much more vibrant than uh, TV and film generally. So I will sometimes, uh, I want to say one of the sites is called Video Static, and they just talk about music videos and stuff on there. And, you know, some of them are just color by the number, like rap videos or something like that. But, but you know, every week or so, there's, there's amazing music videos coming out. Um, and I also like to go look on the Vimeo uh, staff picks page. I still think that's a great place to go look at really cool videos that people are making. Mm -hmm. uh, what was the other thing? That was creativity. Refreshing oh, yourself as a person. How do you disconnect? Mm, burning man. <laughs> <laughs> Which is not happening this year. But uh, yeah, that's a big week long thing every year. And that uh, really is like a disconnect from the normal world and kind of recharge your batteries and get optimistic about what humanity can do. I bet nobody on this call would have thought you'd say Burning Man. <laughs> um, what aspect of your work are you most proud of right now? 
Uh, I mean, we recently on my team worked on the new Premiere feature called Productions. And that is the culmination of a year of kind of direct work on that feature, but really three or four years of work that started even before I joined the team on getting Premiere to a state where it could have, you know, like com compete, <laughs> compete well with collaboration and shared storage environments. And so as I started on the, on the team I'm on at Premiere when I joined, that was something that they were maybe about halfway done with. And so to see that all to completion now and to be able to sort of evangelize it and, and to see the feedback from people, you know, the number of comments I've gotten that have just been like, wow, Premiere has needed this for years. This is so great. Thank you. You know, it's, that's like I said, that's like catnip to me. It's just doing that kind of thing. So I'm, I'm very proud of, of productions and how it turned out. And, and I got to also stretch my wings a bit. Remember we talked before about looking for ways that you can do things to kind of grow and do extra things. I, in talking with the team, we realized, you know, for this, this is a whole change in how Premiere's project structure works. We can't just like ship it and not explain it to people. It's just gonna, it's just gonna be confusing and not get used and all that stuff. And so we decided we really need to make good documentation. And I put my hand up to kind of take the lead on, I'm gonna write a 20 some page PDF and like, <laughs> we're gonna document the heck out of the feature, screenshots, all that kind of stuff. And, and so I'm really proud of that too, as, as something that was, you know, no one asked me explicitly to do. It wasn't like your job is to document this in this way. It was seeing a gap and, and pushing myself to kind of try it. Yeah. So we're out of time and I'm going to, um, I'm going to ask one more question, kind of asked it before, but what is the most valuable piece of advice you think you've gotten and one that you want to leave with everyone today? Hmm. I want to, I'm going to go back to that quote that I said I got from my color mentor when he, he told me you don't have to be an editor. Uh, and, and so you could generalize that to a more broadly applicable thing is you don't have to, the plans that you made were based at one point in life were based on what you knew at that time and when, what you know has changed, feel free to throw that plan out and try something different. And that's, that's something I try to live by and make big choices based on that. So you don't have to be an editor. Yes. The, your view of the world is very narrow when you are young and you yeah. get inspired by a movie and then it just opens up <laughs> from there. So if you continue to be open-minded, your only good things will be offered to you, right? Very wise, Kylie. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I had to make up for part of my room collapsing. Work yeah, from home. Yeah, everything okay over there? Yeah, it's like, uh, we're all improvising here, man. I don't know. <laughs> well, thank you so much for for this. This was really, um, no, it wasn't an earthquake. This was a really great um, <laughs> uh, discussion. And I'm really grateful to have people that I can bring into this and share so openly and with such vulnerability. Everybody needs to remember that no matter where you are in your career, you have something to teach someone else. So even though you're not on the screen right now, you probably could, and you could probably fill an hour with your thoughts. So just a, a couple of quick announcements before I wrap this up. Let me share my screen. Ah. So just uh, to repeat some announcements I've had before, there is a 50% discount on virtual courses right now, and I am doing the Imaging Fundamentals one, and boy, is there a lot of math. Woo! <laughs> but it's great. Um, there is currently, uh, to help with the pandemic and the impact, there are free access to articles in the Motion Imaging Journal and webcasts and microsites. And if you're a student, you can join free and then renew for $15, which is amazing. And this uh, session, this series, is run by Cynthia Hollywood, and just uh, a quick congratulations to the new leadership that is starting next month. We've got a new section chair, Linda Rosner, and the names in bold are joining their two new two-year term as section managers. So that's super exciting. And I'll be back next Thursday at noon with Molly Schalk. Uh, she is an Emmy nominated editor. So if you are into editing, here's where you can go. She's on the uh, Motion Picture Editors Guild board and she is very involved with young professionals 
and getting started in the industry. So it should be a really great discussion. And you can find all the signups on our Cynthia Hollywood Facebook page. So thank you again, Matt, for coming and sharing your story. And we'll see you again next week. Thanks, Kylie. Thanks,